I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about sort of this wild and crazy world in which we live um, with a particular focus on uh, trade policy. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say a few words. Uh, I think it's important to, to remember uh, where we've come from. Um, I won't be too long. Uh, and then talk about where I think we are. And then maybe spend a little bit more time on where I think we would want to be. Uh, and then I'll try to uh, connect all that to your life here in New Zealand and to mine at the OECD. Um, so I trust we all remember uh, the rules-based multilateral trading system that has the WTO at its center. Um, and remember uh, just how much uh, predictability and certainty uh, that system uh, has provided to all of us, but in particular to traders and to investors. Uh, so whether you believe that a little or just a lot uh, of multilateral um, market opening uh, has happened over the past couple of decades, I think it's, uh, it's really important, especially today, to recall that we, we do have in place, we have had in place a well-established foundation of agreed disciplines, um, that have helped to, to mitigate uh, some of the worst uh, protectionist tendencies that began to emerge after the economic crisis. And we have uh, very clear processes in place for multilateral trade policy review, dispute settlement, and negotiations. So that's the good news. Now, uh, these processes have not uh, worked as the architects uh, had intended them to work. And this is contributing to some pretty significant frustrations across a number of countries and, and a number of, of, of business sectors. Um, New Zealand has been, I think, particularly um, actively engaged multilaterally, making best efforts uh, to make the system work better. Uh, you've also been uh, extremely uh, strategic and, I suppose, equally opportunistic in moving forward on, on what we used to call free trade agreements, but I think are properly called economic partnership arrangements, uh, with your major trading partners. Um, and this is a good thing. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but to, to, to many of us, um, New Zealand is an extremely good example of a small country uh, with good ideas and very talented people uh, punching well above your weight uh, globally. Um, so there's many, many examples. I'm not going to name them. Uh, some of them are in the room. Uh, but New Zealand, for such a small country, uh, is uh, incredibly visible and active, and I think I would say as well successful uh, on the international scene. So you, you full credit uh, to you. Um, now, I've said that, I, in our view, um, the multilateral trading system, the rules-based system, uh, hasn't worked as intended. Neither have domestic policies. Um, since the economic crisis in 2008, 2009, um, the automatic stabilizers that many of us, many countries had in place didn't stabilize very much, and the emergency policies that were introduced at the same time uh, underperformed as well. Uh, and didn't do nearly uh, what was expected in terms of mitigating some of the most negative impacts uh, on uh, people, uh, on regions, and on entire sectors of our economies. So the, the subsequent <coughs> decline in growth, the increase uh, in within-country uh, inequalities, um, the continued advancement of technologies and worries about the future of work, um, all contributed to fuel people's fear about the future and added considerably to public skepticism uh, on the benefits of trade and contributed to um, pretty widespread calls for protection and protectionist policies. Now, um, that's all I wanted to say really about where we've come from. A few words about where I think we are today. and. Frankly, I'm not sure. I've been too busy to check the news, so I'm not really sure where we are today. Which, so you all understand what I'm going to say next, which is exactly the issue, isn't it? Um, there, there is a, a, a dearth of, of, of certainty, of, of unpredictability in the trade policy world. Uh, this is weighing heavily on, on economic growth prospects. 
Um, the latest OECD economic forecast, just like forecasts from the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and others, continue to be adjusted downwards, virtually quarter after quarter. We're expecting global growth around 3.2% this year. On the assumption that trade tensions decline, uh, we expect growth a little bit higher next year. That's a really big assumption. And if trade tensions do not decline, uh, we're not particularly optimistic uh, about growth forecasts going forward. Now, there's two parts to this. Um, I don't know if it's optimism, pes pessimism, or realism, but two, two elements. One, the direct impact of the trade restrictions that have been introduced recently uh, are, are particularly important for some sectors of manufacturing and some parts of the agricultural sector. Um, and it, so if you've been in one of those sectors, some of these restrictions that have been introduced recently hurt, and they hurt a lot. But in the aggregate, in terms of the impact on global GDP, it's not so big, perhaps in the, in the vicinity of 0.5% in aggregate. Now, it's not about the aggregates. It, aggregates is about whether or not you're a part of that target that's been hit or not. The much bigger impact, though, relates to not uh, the, the, the immediate impact, the direct impact of a, of a restriction and an impact on either your import or your output market. Uh, it's the uncertainty that's been, been created. Um, and a number of international organizations, and I think the best work, in fact, has been done by the IMF, have attempted to estimate this uncertainty impact. And the best estimate I've seen suggests it's probably four times greater than the direct impact. So when, when traders, when investors are not sure what's going to happen next, they put their money back on their mattress. Uh, so you have, a, you have a drag on investment, you have a drag on confidence, and you have a, a drag on economic growth. And, and that's where we are today. Um, I don't know if this is going to work here. I used this line yesterday. Some people understood what I was saying. Some people didn't. Um, but, it, you know, it used to be when in these kinds of times we said, you know, yeah, it's not so good, but it really can't get much worse. So I don't use that expression anymore. <laughs> I think it can get worse, and uh, I worry that it might get worse, uh, in fact, before, uh, before it gets better. Um, today, there may be certainly more than in my experience or in my career, there's, there's more politics in trade. Um, there's always been, but there seems to be, there seems to be more. Long-standing relationships are being questioned. Support for multilateral rules seem to be in decline. Conflict is replacing cooperation. And international dialogue, where it happens, is much more transactional, it's more bilateral, it's more short-term, and even then, it's more unpredictable. Really big relationships are dominating the headlines, US-China, US-EU, US-Japan, the trilateral initiative between the US, uh, Japan, and the European Union. Um, all of these uh, are, are big, important uh, conversations. So what's gonna happen next? I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I do know that what happens next is going to matter a lot. Continuation of recent trends, more trade restrictions, more bilateral commitments to purchase commodities or products, more agreements to constrain exports. These kinds of outcomes are going to continue to impose significant costs on businesses, continue to dampen investment, slow trade growth, with the resulting impact on, uh, on, on wider economic growth. Now, the, the recent uh, G20 summit has just concluded. Uh, I think it highlights very well the difficulty in reaching global consensus on, on trade these days. Um, so if you're in the trade business for a very long time, you, you, you have to be optimistic. So the good news is that uh, there was a summit uh, that uh, countries continue to talk. Um, that's good. Um, there, there is, I think, uh, very good news in uh, the reality that um, while there weren't concrete decisions made on trade measures, uh, there was as clear a, uh, a discussion around not just the imperative to reform the WTO, but uh, a discussion and some clarity around how to do so. Now, we're a long way from agreement, but I think there is a, an increased uh, acknowledgement that uh, 
um, the, a multilateral system, uh, international cooperation, the central role of the WTO is important. Uh, it uh, it needs uh, it needs some uh, some updating. I think this is uh, uh, if you're an optimist, this is this is good news. Um, if you're a pessimist, then stay tuned. Um, at the same time, uh, countries at the WTO uh, are making um, interesting proposals for reform. Uh, I think there's an incredibly welcome, or should be a welcome focus on the trade policy review system itself, one of the key pillars of, of the WTO architecture, uh, because it's designed to provide transparency, it's designed to provide information and opportunity to resolve uh, difficulties and differences before they really occur. Uh, this is important. The negotiating arm of the WTO, as I say, you can be optimistic, you can be enthusiastic or unimpressed by what it's delivered so far. Um, but in, in either case, it's certainly much less than the original ambitions uh, from almost 20 years ago now. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that a, a more flexible approach to negotiations allowing willing countries to move when they're, when they're able to do so without necessarily getting, getting buy-in from 164 members of the WTO, uh, th this is an area that, that of reform that's of interest to many. Uh, the dispute settlement uh, process you know, the crown jewel of the WTO, it was originally envisaged to resolve disputes in 12 to 13 months. The average has been three and a half years. Um, so that's a long time. And so you can do something and you got a three and a half year head start. Um, and this is an issue that is of concern to many. In fact, your own uh, David Walker, uh, your ambassador to the WTO, is leading uh, efforts at the, w at, at the WTO to, uh, to try and bring some much needed reforms. Um, so I don't know if you all know David, but you should say a prayer for him tonight. He's got a difficult, difficult task, but he's doing, he's, he's doing, he's doing God's work. I guess it's not a pillar of the WTO, but I think it's, it would be negligent not to make a comment on one of the other irritants uh, to the system. Um, and that's the, uh, the possibility for countries to self-designate as developing countries, developing countries uh, at the WTO. Um, of which some 130 odd of the 100, roughly of the 164 have have taken that opportunity. Uh, so there are very many developing countries in the WTO, uh, some very large economies, some relatively well advanced economies uh, that uh, have uh, significant increased flexibilities to any commitment that's agreed. And this is a this is a concern to to, to many. And there are very strong views on both sides of of, of that conversation. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to, to ignore the reality um, that in, in addition to the three pillars, the, the trade policy review, negotiations, dispute settlement, there's, a, there's another cross-cutting issue that matters, and that's this, this issue of self-designation of developing country status. Um, so that'll take a lot of conversation to, uh, to advance. In terms of uh, uh, trade negotiations themselves, um, there's a working, uh, there are working groups on agriculture that continue to toil away 19 years on. Uh, I think common wisdom is that there's no imminent uh, breakthrough likely. Um, but I want to be, somebody chuckled, you, you find that that's like, <laughs> okay, there's no likely possibility. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm contrary minded on this. I'm, I choose to be optimistic and, 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 and here's why. Um, I think it is clear that there is no widespread interest in ag policy reform as such. Uh, but there is a robust interest uh, in discipline, in bringing disciplines to bear on industrial subsidies. And if you want to advance rules and disciplines at the WTO on industrial subsidies, and you suggest that to some members of the WTO, their initial reaction always is, I might talk to you about that, but you need to reform your agricultural policies first. I think that's a fantastic offer. So I would say yes, let's do that. Let's have a serious conversation about all of the policy-induced distortion, distortions on international markets. So a little bit of pain for everybody, an awful lot of gain for everybody as well. Um, so you decide whether that's fantasy or realism, but it's, it's a view that you're not going to convince me is, uh, is not one worth hanging on to. Um, 
I think there's much more uh, enthusiasm and widespread support uh, amongst the, the, the 76 countries that have launched a plurilateral on digital trade e-commerce uh, at the WTO. Um, they have very ambitious targets. It's a very difficult issue. There's very divergent views. But it is so important to, it is such a major part of all of our economies that not investing everything we have to invest in, in, in coming up with, a, with an outcome would be, would be seriously negligent. So I'm, I'm optimistic that there, there can be some progress. Uh, we're dedicating a lot of work in, in my group at the OECD uh, to try and inform those negotiations to bring a little more evidence to bear on the patchwork of, of regulations that govern uh, cross-border data flows in particular. Um, so I, again, I choose to be optimistic. Um, just a comment on fishery subsidies where I think there's more optimism at the WTO than maybe I have. Um, negotiations are advanced, are, 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 are moving on. It's, it's, um, it's an important agreement, uh, not just for the economic outcomes that you'd see, but the environmental ones as well, if, uh, if we can actually get a grip on, on some of the most distorting um, and, and environmentally, environmentally detrimental forms of, of, of subsidy. So we, we continue to support that as well. Um, we'll see what, uh, what, what comes out. So, you know, whether there's, there's significant WTO reform or whether there's, um, uh, there, there's big negotiated outcomes or not, um, there, there's some things that I think that, that we can do if we want to move to a happier place. Uh, we don't have to, to rely on uh, the WTO or big plurilaterals and certainly bilaterals won't, won't get the job done either. Um, so um, your, your government has a, has a trade for all agenda. Um, so I don't know if they borrowed that from the OECD or the European Union or somebody else, but in 2017 we produced a little small paper uh, with some enormous messages. Uh, the paper is called Making Trade Work for All. If you never read anything else produced by the OECD, read this. It's 14 pages. We even put all the figures and graphs and data and footnote in the back so you can tear off that bit. You don't need to read it. There's 14 pages of a narrative that we pretend it's about trade. It's not. It's mostly about domestic policy and the imperative to have your domestic policy aligned with your trade agenda if you, if you want to have substantial outcomes and if you want to have outcomes that benefit more people. So making trade work better for more people, for more regions, for more parts of your economy uh, is not going to come from trade policy alone. It's going to come from domestic policy that's well aligned uh, with your interests, with your capacity, uh, and addresses the redistributive uh, agenda that, that you might have. Um, I think this is, uh, this is incredibly important. It's important as well to recognize that there's a reason that people are agitated about trade and globalization and in some cases technology. Uh, there's, there's a significant part of our populations that in fact have been left behind. Uh, the income, the wealth inequalities are, are, are important. Uh, the one that scares me the most I think is, is recent work that another part of the OECD is not in my group. Uh, undertook about a year ago that, that, that documented the, the increase in um, inequalities of opportunity. So wealth and income inequalities, kind of they affect me. Uh, inequalities of opportunity affect my kids. So you want to you wanna get me agitated, you can take a, you know, you can, you can have a run at me, don't have a run at my kids. And I think th this explains in part the frustration and the concern that, that people have about the future. Um, and you tack on to that the technological developments. Uh, uh, I don't know any institution that doesn't have an initiative that, that's, that's labeled something like the future of work. Um, so I think it's, it, it's incredibly important that we accept uh, that people uh, are, are nervous, people are frustrated, and some people are angry. And we have to decide what to do about that and trade and trade agreements is not going to resolve it. It can create opportunities, but absent domestic policies that improve your supply capacity, domestic policies that, that improve your redistributive uh, capacity within, uh, within your countries, um, we're going to continue to have uh, large parts of our population frustrated. Um, the, the, 
so the story in, I mean, that essentially is the story in making trade work for all. Uh, I hope I haven't discouraged you from reading the 14 pages. Uh, but there's an element as well that, that comes back to the, to the importance of international economic cooperation. Um, and part of that, some of that is about trade agreements and binding disciplines, but some of it, some of it is not. Some of it is about uh, voluntary standards and principles and guidelines. Uh, some of it is about injecting transparency uh, so that there's fewer mysteries and fewer suspicions about what others do. Some of it is simply about, about policy dialogue and being willing not just to talk at others, but to, to, to listen to each other and, and understand perspectives uh, and, and accommodate uh, and, and engage and not expect to win uh, all the time. So there, there's a, an, an element to the international cooperation agenda that has to do with trade and it has to do with economic cooperation more broadly. And if we can align that with, uh, with better domestic policies, I think we'll all be in a, in a happier place. So I've been asked to say a few words about, like, so what for New Zealand? Uh, what, is, what does all this mean? Uh, and I'm not going to be overly helpful. I think I've been here now 36 hours, so I don't think I, I, I have the right to tell you what to do, but I've been doing what I do for 36 years or so, so I'm going to give you a few thoughts. But take them, you know, this is a Canadian visiting your country. I live in France. I don't even know where I'm from anymore. Uh, so let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you a few thoughts that you can accept or reject, and I won't be offended. I think it's incredibly important to continue to engage uh, internationally, to be unapologetic globalists. Um, they're in short supply, uh, and I think we, we need more of them. Your country, just like mine, can afford to, to wait, to react. You have to anticipate and prepare, and you have to prepare for all contingencies. You're not going, there's a lot of things you're not going to be able to change. Uh, so being flexible, being nimble, which is what you've been for a very long time, I think is important. You have to invest in the international uh, system, the multilateral rules-based system, but you can't count on it. Invest and do your best, but in the meantime, carry on being opportunistic. You know, do FTAs and EPAs with, with countries that are willing to do them uh, with you. Um, I think, again, this is, uh, th th this is important. Um, there's a lot of things that you... Um, can do domestically. Um, good trade policy is not uh, only something that countries negotiate. You can make really good trade policies uh, at home. Uh, you know, are your border procedures as fluid as they might be for businesses wanting to import uh, as well as export? Um, you can. These are things that you can address yourself. You don't need to wait until there's a, until there's a, a, an international agreement. And I've already talked about the importance of of aligning uh, trade and domestic policy to make sure that you've got the needed public and private investment in, 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 in people in particular, in education, skills, entrepreneurship. It's not just about equipping people for jobs, it's equipping people to create jobs. And in fact, it's probably more about that. I have a, I have a story. Jemima, should I tell my story about, okay, I'm gonna tell you a story about, I have three kids. This is a true story. So one of them uh, is an environmental engineer. He worked in a big mining company, got promoted, was project manager, new CEO. They shut down the project, so he lost his job. Uh, so he worried for 20 minutes, and then he began to work for himself. He started a company maybe 10 years ago that, that still operates. He doesn't want a job. He, he, he's running his own company. I have another kid that took a long time to get out of high school and eventually get in the workforce. Um, he's in the IT business. He had a job in government for maybe six months, lost his job, started his own company with two other guys. Now he doesn't want to work for anybody. He's, he's got his own, his own firm. Worries the death out of me, uh, both of them, but they somehow, they're better off than I am, but somehow they're, they're, they're able to make it work. Third guy is in prison, but he teaches. He's a guidance counselor in a prison. Couldn't get a job teaching high school, so went up north. Gotcha, didn't I? <laughs> I always get somebody, it, this is a true story. So he, my, my, the moral of my story, okay, they all wanted jobs, they all wanted jobs like I have, jobs like many of you had. Uh, two of the three are very, very happy with their own businesses. Um, third guy, very, very happy, even though he has a buzzer when he goes into prison to teach in case something goes wrong. Very, very happy, but very atypical. None of them, this was not in their career plan. 
Uh, and I think this is the, this is the reality. This is this is what young people are facing. And and what are we doing to equip them? Okay, so that that was a distraction. I didn't mean to get in all that, but I I like that story a lot because if somebody gasps and when I say I have a kid in prison, he's getting out soon. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, so the last point I wanted to make relates to. Um, whether or not um, there, there's anything that, 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 that we can do with the OECD to be helpful to you as you try to confront this very uncertain, unpredictable uh, trade policy environment. And I, and, I, and I think there are a couple of things. Um, I mean, we may live in a, in a post-truth world, but I think facts still do matter, uh, and evidence matters, and good analytics matter. Uh, at least I hope that's right, because I've got nothing else. You know, the, the business that we're in is in providing information, evidence-based analysis and advice. Uh, we're not elected. You take it, you leave it. Uh, but uh, I think we can, we can do a, a great deal to inform some of the, the, the decisions that your governments make. Um, we measure government support uh, across agriculture, fisheries, fossil fuels, and increasingly industrial sectors. We've got data going back 30 years that shines a very bright light into very dark corners uh, of, of policy uh, around the world. Uh, we're monitoring the, the regulatory policies across export credits, uh, export restrictions, non-tariff measures as they affect trade in goods, uh, services uh, regulations that affect trade and services, cross-border data flows, uh, trade facilitation. We do this not just for the 36 OECD countries or the other 15 countries with whom we work all the time. Most of these data sets cover 100 or more countries, some of them 160, 165 countries. Uh, so there's a lot of, of information available on what governments do, uh, which allow us then to, 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 to build uh, and to utilize uh, analytical tools. Uh, we create it with others, uh, measures of trade and value added. So you don't have to add up customs receipts. You can actually look at value that's created uh, as um, goods and services cross borders. We've built trade models. My point is there's a, there's a wealth of data, there's a wealth of evidence, there's a wealth of analysis that, that helps to inform decisions you make. You, you make good or bad decisions. We remind you of what you've done and of the impact that you have had whether it's an impact that you intended or, or otherwise. I want to conclude with, with just one piece of analysis that, um, that we did recently where we, we looked at, so what happens if we um, reduce tariffs uh, to the lowest level applied by any G20 country? And then what happens if we um, reduce uh, the unnecessary costs associated with non-tariff measures that restrict trading goods to roughly the, 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 the best practice across G20 countries. What happens uh, if we liberalize uh, services regulations to the level applied in the single market uh, in, in the European Union, which is not quite a single market, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the closest thing we have to good practice. So we, we analyzed what happens if we move closer across these three areas, tariffs, NTMs, and services, to what some countries have been able to do. Pretty practical, feasible proposition. Um, if you do these things individually, you get an impact on household, a positive impact on household income of about three, three and a half percent. If you do them all, if you do tariffs and you do NTMs and you do services, the increase in household income across the G20 economies is close to six percent. It's because of the the fact that you get at the binding, the binding constraint to trade openness and, and, and to growth by doing all of these things simultaneously. 6%. Global growth today is 3.2. Thank you very much for your attention.